Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In this episode, we're essentially looking at part two in the Dave Yoakum narrative, essentially the crime scene analyst. It's really interesting what he talks about uh, using Blue Star reagent, trying to find blood, for example, at the Chris Watts crime scene unsuccessfully and just how they sort of systematically went through the crime scenes both at 2825 Saratoga Trail and Survey 319 and of course the two crime scenes are linked and if you didn't go to the one crime scene you wouldn't have known what was necessarily relevant at the other including the the bed sheet for example also the color of the hair of the children now before we get to today's episode just two other episodes that are coming up on this channel uh, one of them is the number two subject missing from American Murder, The Family Next Door. In the previous episode, we spoke about the multi-level marketing, Thrive, that whole aspect uh, kind of in conjunction with the serious financial issues that the, the Watts family was suffering from. And of course, the, 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 the money situation, the debt, the bankruptcy was a major part of the motive, probably 50 to 60 percent of the motive for why the case happened, why the crime happened. Now we're going to look at the other half of that equation, which is arguably also 50 to 60 percent uh, of why the, the uh, crime occurred. And of course, the Netflix documentary was all about telling Shanann's story. But it didn't really tell Nicole Kessinger's story and we're going to sort of look at that in more detail in the number two subject missing. While we're on that subject, are there any other subjects that you felt were missing from the documentary? Something that was very much part of the Chris Watts narrative but you didn't see there. If so, please leave your answer in the comments and we, we might look at that as number three. And then... The eighth and, at this point, final deep dive into the evidence, we're going to look at the two vehicles uh, in, in a lot of detail. We're going to look at the Lexus and we're going to look at the Ford Lariat F250 work truck that was what's used. And, um, and that should conclude the uh, evidence deep dive. Also, in that respect, if you feel there's other evidence that you'd like me to look at in terms of the crime scenes, in terms of the sort of evidence and artifacts that you feel I haven't looked at yet, let me know and, and we'll, we'll sort of look into that. So if you're interested in watching that sort of content, then uh, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like, share, leave a comment. If you do share, please, please use the hashtag TCRS, for example, on Twitter. And let's get started. So once again, we heading straight uh, through to the discovery and we're on page 809 and it's the crime scene report from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation Forensic Services Division, right? And this particular report was authored by Dave Yoakum. I think um, I made a bit of a mistake in the previous episode Although it referenced Dave Yoakum, it wasn't actually authored by him. This one is. Now, what's interesting about the date of the report is September 13, so a whole month later. And I think it had s certain additional information in it because of that. And um, so let's go to the narrative. And as I say, this is um, written by crime scene analyst Dave Yoakum. On Tuesday, August 14th, 2018, at approximately 2300 hours, I, Colorado Bureau of Investigation, uh, CBI, crime scene analyst CSA Dave Yoakum, was contacted by CBI crime scene manager D. Maloney and requested to respond to 2825 Saratoga Trail in Frederick, Colorado at 0600 hours on Wednesday, August 15th, 
to assist with the processing of a residence in which three family members had been reported missing by their family and friends. Now, something just to bear in mind with this is Dave Yoakum was contacted at 2300 hours, which was really the time Chris Watts was released from, well, he wasn't really released, as in he wasn't in their custody, but he was let go of, where they basically um, let Chris, how can I put it, Chris Watts was talking to FBI agent Graham Coder, and that conversation sort of ended uh, it started at about 7 o'clock in the evening and it ended at about 11 o'clock. Um, and then almost immediately when Chris Watts left the building, I think he got a drive, a ride home with um, the Thayers. So he didn't even have his own transport at that point. I think his, his truck had been impounded and the Lexus uh, as well. Certainly the, neither of those vehicles were at his disposal at that point. And so the walls are sort of moving in. And so not wasting any time um, at 11 o'clock on Tuesday night, moments after finishing his uh, interview with Chris Watts, which was more like an interrogation, um, the, uh, the law enforcement contacted uh, Dave, Dave Yoakum um, well, essentially through D, uh, Maloney and wanted him on the scene at 0600 the next morning. Now, what they were going to be doing, as far as I understand, is they were going to be processing that, that crime scene, certainly what Coda told Watts, that same night. So one kind of gets the idea that on August the 14th, that night, they, they, went, they went to the house. And so Yoakum only joined the party, if you want to put it that way, at 0600 hours on Wednesday. And that would be a very long day for the crime scene analyst. After the Saratoga Trail scene was processed, I was notified at 1630 hours on August 15th by CSM Maloney to respond to a remote location in Rogan. Okay, so bear in mind, um, that was the next part of his day. So, although he was at the uh, Saratoga Trail first thing in the morning, by late afternoon he was summoned to another, another crime scene, but the, the same, by the same criminal, obviously. And uh, it's really interesting what he says about both crime scenes. On... Monday, August 20th, Maloney requested I respond to uh, Frederick, Colorado to assist with the processing on two vehicles. I suppose I could mention the address there. Um, but I'm going to do that, uh, although I'm going to be building up to this, I'm going to be dealing with that separately, just dealing with the two vehicles, but via Dave Yoakum. Okay. So he's basically just providing a summary here of what it's all about. Now we go into the detailed information on page 810. Again, just to be clear, the report when he finally writes it is around about a month later. So now the scene investigation at 2825 Saratoga Trail. Upon my arrival at the residence at 0545 hours, so he arrived about 15 minutes ahead of when he was supposed to be there, conscientiously, he met with Frederick Police Department Detective Dave Bormhover and two officers, Wallier and Perez. Now, we've already seen that Wallier took photos and Perez was the one officer who was sort of around when the cadaver dog handlers um, were uh, in situ. So we know who they are. Uh, I still want to go through the narratives of Officer James and I think Officer Goodman. According to Detective Bormover, the house had been searched with the consent of the owner, Chris Watts, on at least three different occasions. That's quite important to highlight. So, by the time Yoakum arrives, the cops have kind of been up and down through the house three different times. And they still 
kind of hanging around. They, they, they're looking for something. They're looking for something that isn't apparently there. They know something is afoot, something there has been foul play, but they just can't find what it is. And so Yoakum is there to sort of address that. The searches were conducted by members of the Frederick Police Department and included canine searches from cadaver dogs. So we sort of know about the canine searches to some extent. You see, at, you see two of the cadaver dogs, you don't really see the bloodhound in action. One thing I do want to mention about the searches with, with the dogs is a cadaver dog doesn't really need scent items of, of a person it's always going to find cadaver traces. When you are giving scent items to a dog, you're really trying to track individuals. So one's got to be quite explicit about that, that a cadaver dog is essentially going to be uh, alerting to uh, cadaver traces, which, which is very, um, uh, like a, it's a standard thing, if I can put it that way. So... Something like a scent item, I'm not sure whether all cadaver dogs are trained to do that. Um, maybe some of you know that, but just something like cadaver odor is something that, that cadaver dogs are trained to sniff out. Uh, Detective Bormover Detective also stated the owner, husband and father of the missing woman and children, Chris Watts, had given consent to collect any and all evidence that police could use to locate his missing family. So just a little um, protocol that is covered there. Chris Watts also stated to detect a bomb over the home could be processed with forensic methods to obtain evidence relating to his family's disappearance. Now, just to, I just want to contrast something like this with one other case. And let's make it the JonBenet Ramsey case. Now, you might say, no big deal. Um, Chris Watts gave consent to take whatever he wanted to and blah, blah, blah. And you know, it's not a big deal. It, it actually is a big deal. If you look at the John Bonet Ramsey case, um, the police didn't really have the luxury of access to the crime scene and taking whatever they wanted from the crime scene. And what actually happened in the John Bonet Ramsey case was somebody that's related to the um, Patsy Ramsey side of the family staged a kind of one-person raid of the crime scene even while the police were present and as far as I know she was actually given a police not a police uniform but I think a police jacket to, to put on possibly to um, avoid questions from the media but um, she loaded her car this particular person loaded her car full of um, items from the Ramsey home and uh, we don't know this for sure, but one of those items could have been the book by um, John Douglas, Mindhunter. That book was seen in crime scene photos, but it was never um, retrieved from the crime scene. So what does that tell you? Then, um, so all I'm saying is you can have interference from a crime scene by someone who's not necessarily directly related and the authorities didn't have that problem in the Watts case. So I'm just saying you can have a situation where there is interference. You could perhaps make the argument that uh, Nicholas um, Atkinson interfered with the crime scene by finding the phone, for example, and um, Nicole Atkinson by finding Shanann's handbag. You could argue that that was a violation of the protocol. So something that I came across recently was at some point Nicole Atkinson made a video talking about how her son had just to sort of play in a good humored way play kind of a trick on Shanann um, while she was away um, moved um, f uh, what do you call it moved portraits or pictures slightly differently to the way they were and um, so in other words changed a lot of things when they were in the house this is before the crime happened and um, that video has since been removed 
And you can kind of imagine how that could play into um, a defense's hands if they, if they sort of found something like that, just that somebody else had entered the, the house and changed things to, to a large extent. I don't, uh, I don't think Chris Watts has a snowflake's uh, hope in hell in mounting a um, successful defense, but there certainly are a couple of loopholes that he may wish to take advantage of. Where that's going to get him, I don't know. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that he murdered his family, and I don't think there's any doubt that um, you know he's responsible. But what he might be able to do is um, provide some slight mitigation factors um, that is that is possible. Anyway, let's go back to the narrative. Detective Bormov and I agreed that I would photograph the residence. So I don't believe we've seen these um, these photos. We've seen the photos of Officer Wallier, but as far as I know, we haven't seen the photos from um, uh, Dave Yoakum. Um, and these would be high-quality photos using a high-quality camera, and an SLR camera. I've got one of them. Um, so... Part of Yoakum's function would be photographing the residents. He would also utilize Blue Star latent bloodstain reagent. And that is something that is often used to check whether there's either blood or something like um, bleach. So it would also show up something like bleach. Having said that, there are some of these reagents that also react to something like fruit juice. I think it responds to certain fluids that are, have a certain amount of acidity in them, if that makes sense. Um, and so, specifically, it was going to go to the areas alerted on by the canines and assist with the collection of any evidence located in the residence. So this is going to be quite targeted. He was going to go to the areas alerted on by the canines, which shows you that he, that the authorities took the uh, work of the dogs quite seriously, even though it wasn't a um, confirmed alert. They f felt that there was definitely interest by the by the canines, and and this was the follow up work for that. Uh, what, what's a little bit unfortunate for me is that we don't have photos of this particular part of the investigation. We don't see them processing the scene. One wonders whether there is uh, footage of that. If there were any officers on duty, which obviously we know there were, then there has to be body cam of that going on, and, and we haven't seen that yet. Um, he would then assist with the collection of evidence located in the residence. It was agreed upon that the CBI would not collect the evidence, FPD would collect and package all evidence located in the search. I find that quite interesting, that the Colorado Bureau of Investigation would sort of butt out and Frederick Police Department would collect and package all evidence. Um, I'm not a defense lawyer, but I, I wonder what um, a defense lawyer would make of something like that, that why would a lower authority um, be collecting the evidence? Was it because they were the sort of original party to uh, ask for the CBI's assistance? I'm not sure. According to Detective Bormover, Chris Watts had been living in and accessing the home prior to and since the disappearance of his family on Monday. So, you know, obviously what that was going to tell you is you should expect to find evidence of Chris Watts, his DNA and all that kind of thing. Um, what is missing, I think, in this narrative is that Shanann was hardly home. So Shanann was, the last time Shanann was home was, uh, prior to the crime being committed, was the morning, early in the morning of the 10th of August. So Shanann wouldn't have left all that much traces of herself. So anywhere we where traces of Shanann had been found, given that the house had been cleaned, was likely going to tell you where Shanann had been when she died, if that makes sense. 
especially because she'd not been in the house for most of the prior six weeks. Does that make sense? The same applies, but less so to the children. If you were finding evidence of the children, that would also be indicative of where they were. But bear in mind, they had access to what their home, which would ultimately become the crime scene for the entire, um, you know, um, Sunday, Saturday, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday. I think I think they arrived in Colorado on Tuesday. So. So it wouldn't really apply that much to them. And now we move on to the scene observations. The neighborhood and home is located within a newer residential area consisting of large single family homes. Um, this is what I like about Dave Yoakum. He sees this in a larger fabric, in a larger context. And I do think just that simple observation that the home is in a sort of a new uh, kind of neighborhood kind of a growing neighborhood sort of tells you something about the kind of people living there you know millennials people who are sort of upwardly mobile uh, supposedly quite well off and it would be interesting to do a canvas of the neighbors what sort of jobs everybody did and then compare those to the jobs of the um, of the Watts couple how many people down that same street in Saratoga Trail were also involved in multi-level marketing. How many people in that same street were also oil workers? Just would be interesting to see what did those people do for a living compared to the Watts family? Did the Watts family really belong in that sort of income bracket, that sort of cl so, sort of middle class, would one say upper middle class um, bracket? Did they really belong there or, or not? Um, the fact that they were going to sell their house seems to indicate not. Um, 2825 Saratoga Trail is a two-story single-family residence located on the south side of the street with the front doors facing towards Saratoga Trail. Um, it's two stories with a basement. I think that should be mentioned. And then also where they say single-family residence, well, although it was a single-family residence, um, Shanann's family stayed with them for 15 months and and this was I think close to the time of their first bankruptcy and it's possible that Chris Watts um, intuited or anticipated that that might happen again that her family might come and stay with them again bear in mind Shanann had just stayed with her family for five or six weeks in North Carolina well w weren't um wasn't that sort of on the cards again? And if not her family, maybe another family, maybe the Rosenbergs. And would Chris Watts have liked that idea of another family staying with them? Um, and, and a family that had more to do with Shanann than had to do with him, if that makes sense. Though there's five bedrooms, that's quite a lot, isn't it? Five bedrooms and four bathrooms with office space and unfinished basement and a three-car garage. It's also quite interesting that there's a three-car garage and they, they only had two cars, which suggests they w perhaps wanted three cars but never quite got there. Upon entering the front door, there's a living room and dining room. To the left is a staircase that leads to the upstairs bedrooms, laundry and loft area. Near the staircase that leads upstairs is a hallway that runs to the east side of the house. The hallway provides access to the Basement stairs, a bathroom, utility room, garage entrance, and an office. You can see how astute Yoakum is. He, he notices all these things. He's already got a very global sense of where he is and what he's dealing with. He's seeing things in a three-dimensional way, if that makes sense. And any um, really good investigator does that. You see things in a very um, a macroscopic way and then you can also see things in a microscopic way and that's that's uh, Yoakum's job um, he refers to a door on the south side of the kitchen opens to the backyard of the home so he's aware of all the um, entrances and exits the, the the layout of the the home and so on and I've got to tell you when I started investigating the case um, that was the first thing I did. I kind of tried to find blueprints of the home. 
um, and I was trying to map out the home in my mind, trying to work out where would the crime happen, what what is going on in this house. Um, and the part that I was most interested in that you couldn't really find was the basement. The other thing that is something you want to know in terms of mapping is the family dynamics and that's very very difficult to do and often people are resistant they don't tell you what the true dynamics are like and that is hidden and it takes a long time to actually um, uh, compile the, the true uh, family dynamics the upstairs portion of the home consists of three bedrooms a playroom laundry room and a central te living television room the home is in like new condition with no visible signs of damage and was clean and organized so it was clean and organized but you'll see that it does um, say that there were some exceptions to that a walkthrough of the home showed no signs of forced entry at all basement and first floor windows no doors appear to have been forced or damaged that's just a short way of saying or kind of making the inference that the crime was likely committed not by an intruder or a stranger, but by someone inside the house, by a family member in other words. And that's kind of a similarity again to the John Bonet Ramsey case where there was virtually no sign of forced entry. There was the broken window in the basement and it just shows you if Chris Watts had just broken a window somewhere he could kind of have made that argument as well but that may have set off an alarm if he had broken a window and also since he wanted to sell the house he probably didn't want to break anything if that makes sense now we get to the really interesting area of scene processing photos were taken of the scene blue star latent reagent was applied to all bathroom fixtures tub shower sink toilet which resulted in no signs of chemiluminescence now Quite a few people have made comments saying, for example, some someone said that they think Shanann was attacked in the bathroom or in the shower while she was taking a shower. That is why there are no she she had no defensive wounds or something like that. Um, I said no because you would very likely have hurt yourself against the many sharp corners you get in a bathroom sort of area. But the pertinent point is there's just no evidence of that in the on the bathroom fixtures. Even if Chris Watts had wiped it down, you would have seen some sign of of bleach in the bathroom. You would have it's very difficult to hide all evidence and the fact that there wasn't any is um, sort of indicative that nothing really happened there. Blue Star was also applied at the locations where the searching canines had alerted. And this is the mudroom by the garage, right? And that makes sense that they would alert there because that is the area where you would sort of um, you arrive at the garage and then if you're carrying something, because I think, um, I'm not sure if that door closes by itself, but um, if you closing that door every time you go inside and out, you're going to be putting down heavy objects when you open the door, if that makes sense. Even if you're not going to open the door, I think you've got to go down steps into the garage. So that would be an area. So anywhere where steps terminate, um, you are going to probably put down something that is heavy. And so that makes sense. The same then applies at the top of the basement stairs in the hallway to the mudroom. Okay. At the top of the basement stairs. So that is likely where bodies were placed on the floor, a body or bodies. No signs of chemiluminescence were observed in these areas as well. So even though the canines alerted there, nothing was actually found there, but um, probably Watts cleaned it up. He doesn't really say anything about signs of bleach or anything like that. He says prior to testing, positive and negative presumptive tests were done with expected results. Um, I think that is to do with uh, DNA testing, but it, it could also just be um, blue star tests as well. While assisting with the search of the home, I observed in the kitchen trash, bed sheets and pillowcases. Now, my, my impression from this is 
it, it is Joachim who actually found the bedding in the kitchen trash. It wasn't Detective Bormover. It wasn't any of the officers who were sniffing around the scene. It was actually Joachim going a little bit further than them, looking a bit closer, looking in detail at different things, including now looking at the garbage. And so it was kind of hidden in plain sight. You, you, you open the garbage bin and, and nothing looks out of the ordinary. But if you look closer and you, you lifted the bag that was above the sheets, um, then you would see the pillowcases. The sheets and pillowcases were grayish in color with numerous small light blue, light green, lavender colored squares on the sheets. The bedding was buried beneath other items of trash. That's important to highlight there. And so when did they discover this bedding in the trash? On Tuesday morning, which means Watts would have had an opportunity potentially to have washed them um, th uh, through the course of the night. Now, of course, it's possible that Watts threw the pillowcase into the trash um, sometime on Monday or um, immediately after committing the crime. I don't think that's the case. And I don't think he would have committed the crime, put th those items in the trash and then just left them there. I think that was the second part of the cover-up, if that makes sense. And so very likely the bedding that was put into the trash had actually already been washed. It washed that, which is why those residues on the, um, on the uh, pillowcase are kind of diffuse they're kind of transparent it's not very very clear it's not a a strong mark if i can put it that way further examination showed the sheet to be a flat sheet and three matching pillowcases stains were observed on the sheets and pillowcases and now we go to discovery page 810 now i think it's just important to stress here that Virtually in the entire house, there was nothing indicative that anything had, had happened, except for this. This was basically the one area where Chris Watts made a mistake in leaving behind evidence. Now, if you take away the pillowcases from the home and the Anadarko site, do you think Chris Watts could have gotten away with murder or do you think he, he would have gotten away with what he was getting away with for longer? I think he would have. Of course, he would also have to not say anything, but there would also be Nicole Kessinger saying, um, I'm having an affair, or I, w I was actively having an affair. Um, I think if Chris Watts handled that differently and said, um, sorry, I was a bit embarrassed to say this, but yes, I was having an affair, my wife suspected me of it and maybe that's why she left. So now we're going to discovery page 811. Uh, the bedding from the kitchen trash was collected by Frederick Police Department throughout the home. Several electronic items and clothing were located and collected, uh, including a laptop, also an iWatch. Um, previously, phones had been collected. Um, and I think possibly also the baby monitor. CBI cleared the scene on Saratoga Trail at 10.45 on August 15th, 2018. So it actually wasn't a very uh, big deal, the processing of the crime scene. 10.45 from basically uh, 5.45 is just five hours. Um, but given the fact that they were finding nothing um you know there's no point in hanging around there any longer than they were there i would be interested to know if they did um a, a, what do you call it a, a chemiluminescence of the bed in the bedroom and also of the sheets that were found he doesn't mention it so i would suspect that they didn't um but of course, it's possible, also possible that if Chris Watts changed the bedding and the bed sheets, then, then that wouldn't really apply. But it still, I think, would be interesting. Um, no evidence was collected by CBI, which I think is just interesting. Now we go to the scene investigation at Anadarko. Um, upon arriving at the Anadarko Wellside property in Rogan, Colorado, at 18.20 hours on Wednesday, 
So he, he really arrived quite late. He was summoned much earlier. He was summoned at 1645, I think. Um, 1630 and arrived there like two hours and um, almost two hours later it's quite a long time so it probably took close to an hour to get there but it probably also took an hour or so to um, kind of make arrangements to get there um, and he was met by several members of the Frederick and Firestone Police Departments on scene. So when you see that drone footage, you're actually seeing the two Firestone Police Department um, pilots, people, those people involved. You're seeing um, Joachim on the ground. Possibly, um, bear in mind, he did arrive quite late. So I'm not sure if... Um, he would have been there before the sunset, but I presume he may have just made it. And then there would also have been um, uh, Matt Saylor and Greg Zentner present from the CBI, and then employees from Anadarko. He said, I learned that CBI and FPD investigators had utilized the GPS tracking system within Chris Watts' work truck to identify the routes Watts had taken the morning the victims had been reported missing. GPS tracking identified the truck to have traveled to the well site we were currently at. So I think the, the main thing that they looked at here was that the truck spent an inordinate amount of time at this one particular well. It arrived early and left relatively late. Whereas if you had cross-referenced it with the other employees, not necessarily, but potentially, they didn't spend as long at any particular well. And they were possibly invariably more than one person at a well site at a time, if that makes sense. The Anadarko company, as well as the owner of the survey ranch, had provided written consent for law enforcement to search the property identified by the GPS tracking system. Agents Sailor and Zent informed me that members of the Firestone PD had utilized a drone to fly over the Anadarko property in Rogan. While the drone was in use, a video feed from the drone showed a sheet on the ground within the fenced area of the Anadarko lease land. So you would have the officers looking at the video feed on a laptop and saying, look over there, isn't that a sheet? So it wouldn't just be the drone pilots looking at this video feed, it would be quite a few people. And one of them may have been Zentner. The sheet had been compared to the photo I had sent to Agent Sailor early in the day when the sheets had been discovered in the kitchen trash. So you had a situation where Yoakum sent the CBI agent the sheets prior to them actually finding it at the Anadarko site. And the fact that the fitted sheet was missing may have made them be on the lookout for it or um, certainly aware that, that it was missing. According to the investigators on scene, the sheets, colors and patterns were consistent with one another. Investigators on scene also stated that from the video taken from the drone, an area void of vegetation had been located and appeared to have been recently disturbed. An Adarko employee stated there was no plausible reason for the disturbance on the land. The disturbed area shared common characteristics consistent with a possible clandestine grave site. It was decided that once the warrant had been signed for the property, CBI would begin the collection of the evidence located around the scene and then begin the excavation of the possible gravesite. So now you have a situation where the CBI are going to collect evidence at the well site. They didn't collect it at the home, but they're going to collect it at the uh, well site. Now, I do remember... Uh, another YouTuber complaining that something about, I think it was a, um, this is just in terms of jur jurisdiction, a video, um, video footage of one of the interviews with Nicole Kessinger was, I think, um, left at the, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I think it was done by the CBI but it was left at a particular police station and when she tried to get permission to get this footage 
each one said, well, it's not our jurisdiction, it's the other one. And um, it m may be because of this confusing jurisdiction of the one crime scene and the other that you have red tape like that kind of coming in the way. But as it is, there is uh, video footage of um, an interview Nicole Kessinger gave that we haven't seen that, that hasn't been released to the public ostensibly because of a jurisdictional issue. Um, anyway, so CBI would then conduct more extensive intrusive searches for any additional evidence that could be located within the scene. CSM Maloney and forensic scientist Schroeder arrived to assist with processing the scene at approximately 20 hundred hours at 8 o'clock. So now you have a forensic scientist on the scene. I, I'm presuming that that is someone who would be picking up things like DNA, perhaps taking samples of the oil, soil samples and so on. Now we get to the really interesting part about scene observations. The Anadarko property is leased property within the Survey Ranch, which is a 35,000 acre cattle ranch located in southeastern Weld County, Colorado. Um, the leased property, known as Oil Tank Field Survey 319, due north of the I-76 and three miles north of the town of Rogan. It's really not that far from Rogan. Um, in fact, there's a Conoco gas station um, very close by. Um, is used for the extraction, collection and storage of raw crude oil from local oil wells and pumps. The Anadarko well site was located approximately nine miles north of Rogan, um, Colorado along dirt roads and dirt, uh, dirt track trails. Now when he says um, it's three miles north of the town of Rogan, I think maybe he's referring to, I'm not, not quite sure, it seems a bit of an inconsistency there. Maybe he's referring to as the crow flies. The site itself is a three to four acre property fence with barbed wire and secured by a locked gate on the west end. The topography and geo features consist of sandy dry soil. So just again, um, there was somebody who sort of thought uh, Chris Watts would never have had time to dig the grave because, you know, it would be so difficult. Well, here they once again just emphasize that it's sandy soil. Sandy soil is, is really easy to, it's like digging beach sand. Um, with sparse native vegetation and dry pasture rangeland for livestock. No structures other than oil collection tanks, pumping equipment and agricultural infrastructure are visible in any direction for several miles. Within the fenced area were two large tanks approximately 20 feet in height and 12 feet in diameter. Each tank is equipped to hold approximately 400 barrels of crude, that is 16,800 gallons, that's a lot. Also within the site was a wellhead, pumping facilities, waste collection and venting uh, pressurization equipment, that's also important. Venting and pressurization equipment means that you have the ability at the site to um, release gases and um, and and sort of hot um how can i put it not product but you can you can vent some of the pressure buildup that is uh, inside these tanks and that is going to cause a disruption of what evidence has been left behind whether uh, has been left behind on the sides of these containers or inside now we go to discovery page a12 Within the site, numerous safety precautions and procedures are in place due to the toxic vapors and volatility. Now we go to Anadarko, day 1, August 15, 2018. At the site, numerous vehicles were parked within the fence perimeter. Due to diminishing daylight, auxiliary lighting was brought in to the scene by Anadarko. And there is at least one photo I've seen where you can see the auxiliary lighting there. It's... Um, sort of a, a post, a metal post with four square lights on it and then beside it is another one and, and it's sort of directed towards Shanann's grave. Located to the south and east of the wellhead was an area that appeared to have been recently excavated and filled back in. So, so in other words, that sort of area, that sort of fenced area, that is the wellhead and that is, I think, where Chris Watts also parked his car closer to Shanann's grave. The area appeared to be approximately 8 feet by 14 feet in diameter. 
living fo foliage was observed partially buried on and under the uneven ground. So they noticed that there was soil covering living plants and that's already that's immediately going to indicate to you that something's going on here. Now bear in mind if you dig a hole um, if, you, if you dig a hole and you just put the soil back into the hole that you've digged out there's already going to be soil left over. If you dig a hole and you put a person in there you're going to have a lot of soil left over and that was why Chris Watts bought the rake because you're going to need to spread that excess soil over the living foliage and he tried to do that he just didn't do it very well once the search warrant for the property had been confirmed to have been signed a more thorough search of the property was done now scene processing uh, photos were taken of the scene with and without markers so i don't believe we've seen um, those markers unless you count those red cones those orange cones as markers Something tells me not, but who knows. Measurements were taken through the use of global positioning um, polar coordinates and a laser measuring device. Blue star latent blood reagent was applied to the thief hatch of each tank after positive and negative presumptive tests of the reagent had been done with expected results. No chemiluminescence chemi was observed on each tank or the catwalk connecting the tanks. So now regarding this i want to be clear on a particular point it's a position of true crime rocket science that bella suffered her the injury to her frenulum post-mortem and that it actually happened while she was being pushed through the hatch it is the position of i think everybody else uh, that this injury was suffered during manual strangulation and that or manual smothering and that Bella, Bella, Bella's um, gums or, or lips were bleeding I mean with a one and a half centimeter tear a big tear to a frenulum in her mouth you'd expect bleeding right and and yet there's no bleeding there's no signs of, of blood or bleeding on the cat on the on this catwalk on this, it's a uh, um, I don't know if catwalk's the right word, but just this um, metal staircase, no blood dripping on there and no blood uh, on the side of the tank. So now bear in mind, even if it had been wiped away, you would it would still come up in chemiluminescence. You would still expect it to come up in chemiluminescence, but it doesn't. Now that either means, it, again, like the, the Watts home, it was cleaned really, really, really well, which I don't think. Or there wasn't any blood uh, there's another possibility as well which is that her body was transported to the hatch inside a black garbage bag and that that the blood would then be inside the black garbage bag not necessarily the one left at the site it could have been another one we don't know how many were ultimately used so that's another possibility but the other possibility is that this um, injury to her frenulum occurred post-mortem and that when and it happened when she was pushed through the hatch and if there was a little bit of um, blood at the bottom of this hatch where you know inside and at the bottom when you vented the tanks that would have destroyed that evidence does that make sense on the north edge of the excavated plot was a rusted rakehead that's evidence exhibit dy4 the rake had been placed with the handle attachment portion buried into the ground to the east of the plot was a wooden, wooden tool handle, DY5, as well as a piece of metal, DY7, that was consistent with connecting a rake head to a rake handle. On the property were two black plastic bags. One bag was located to the west of the excavated plot, DY1, while the bag was located to the south, DY2. To the south of the black plastic bag, DY2, was a bed sheet, DY3. The sheet was a fitted sheet consistent with the same pattern and the colors of the sheet observed in the kitchen trash at the home on Saratoga Trail. As, as the search of the site continued, I observed several strands of suspected hair attached to the interior flange of the top hatch, thief hatch, on the easternmost uh, crude oil storage tank. So what that is telling you is that if, the, if that particular tank was vented, and I believe it was, 
you still had small little pieces of hair that that stubbornly stayed behind does that make sense that what that is also telling you the fact that the hair stayed behind is suggesting that chris watts didn't clean the the hatches or the inside of the hatches okay after the collection of the visible evidence CSM Maloney and I began the excavation of the suspected grave site. So it's interesting that it was the crime scene analyst that did the actual excavation of the grave site. I don't know whether he would literally have scooped away sand or directed the scooping away of sand, but I would imagine that he would do it sort of uh, directly himself, kind of hands on. Approximately nine inches below the surface grade, uh, CSM Maloney and I located the adult female victim believed to be Shannon Watts. So, even though they found the grave um, relatively early on, they, they found what they thought was the grave, they didn't actually do anything for quite a long time. They first had to get uh, information. And now we go on to um, the next section here and you know if this is something that's going to make you queasy uh, you should possibly not not uh, listen any further it's just the observations of Dave Yoakum um, at this point in exhuming um, Shannon Watts the victim was in a fetal position with her knees pulled up to her chest at the bottom of the grave and her feet directed up towards the top of the grave. Her chest and face primarily was facing down into the ground while her back was oriented up. Her head was towards the west while her feet were towards the east. Her left arm was extended to the east along the side of her head. Um, there's some other um, description that has her, both her arms in front of her that's not the, uh, I don't think that's correct. There's only one arm that was extending, um, uh, how can I put it, in front of her. So one, one arm was extending in front of her, the other not. The victim was wearing a blue pair of underwear and a light colored shirt. Now we go to page 813. Uh, I think that is a poor description of the shirt she was wearing. Um, but I guess you couldn't really tell what color it was when it was covered in dirt. Um, it was actually kind of a light gray shirt with, which sort of bled out into kind of a purple color. And then it had a um, silver heart on the front. Um, discovery page 813. Uh, the depth of the grave when the body was removed was approximately 27 inches in depth. The Weld County Coroner took possession of the victim at 0020 hours on Thursday, August 16th. Okay, and then we go to Anadarko Day 2, August 16th, scene processing. Images taken through the use of the drone were taken prior to the arrival of all investigators and support personnel at about 10 o'clock on Thursday, August 16th. So at this point, the children had been at the well site for, for three days. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, the process of, on unloading the contents of the tanks in search of the two juvenile fem females, victims and other evidence began. And Adoka employees and their subcontractors began the process of unloading and emptying the tanks. This consisted of draining the tanks through a gravity fed line at the base of each tank the tray was then emptied through a four inch hose the fact that all of this took so long clearly indicates that this isn't the way chris watts got the children into the tanks to begin with um, once the tanker truck had been filled and no items of evidence had been identified during the course of draining the tank the truck was released with its contents so yeah you have a confirmation that the truck actually leaves the scene with the contents of the, the, the tanks and drives off. So if there was any um, dissolved chemicals or whatever, it would have left with the, with the truck. 
I don't think you would have found anything, but the point is you had this product leaving the scene. Once the tanks were empty, entry to the tanks for body recovery could only be done by specialized, trained and certified personnel. Entry and recovery was done by Colorado State Patrol CSP hazardous materials team through a side hatch located near the bottom side of the tank. Um, Entry into the tank could only be done through the use of self-contained breathing apparatus and full hazardous material fire protection gear. So they do enter these tanks in kind of hazmat suits. Um, okay, now we're going to deal with um, the, ch the recovery of the children and this can be very disturbing to sensitive people. Um, it is in the discovery, but I'm just giving you a warning that it might be um, traumatizing. Upon the completion of emptying the East Tank, a juvenile female victim believed to be Celeste Watts was found buried in crude oil sludge at the bottom of the East Tank. So even though um, the, the oil had been drained, right, even though the oil had gone into it kind of a tanker, um, the, this poor little girl was still found in kind of a, a muddy sludge at, at the bottom of the tank. Does that make sense? Um, the victim was recovered by CSP and was wearing an orange pink colored shirt, shorts and a diaper with no shoes or socks. And this uh, must have astonished me that she was actually wearing, given the tightness of these hatches, that she was still wearing clothing. After the recovery of the victim from the east tank, the west tank was drained under the same procedural guidelines. Again found in the bottom of the tank in the crude sl oil sludge was the second juvenile female victim believed to be Bella Watts. The victim was wearing a pink multicolored shirt and shorts, no shoes or socks. The tanks were both searched for additional evidence. No additional evidence was located. The waste and overflow tank directly to the east of both tanks was visually searched for additional evidence. No evidence was identified or observed. That's discovery page 813. Okay, and so we're not going to take it further than that. Uh, they did a, a search beyond that scene. Uh, they went within the fenced area of the Anadarko scene, um, but they didn't really find anything else. Um, they cleared the scene at the Anadarko site at 1840 hours on August 16th, 2018. So it was a quite a, in terms of the law enforcement, the Watts case sort of involved quite a lot of time running around and and um, undoing and, and just recovering all of the damage that he'd done and trying to find all the evidence that he'd either destroyed and in the case of his family left behind. So I'll be taking you through uh, Joachim's search of the vehicles. That's just one component of what we're going to do in the deep dive. There are obviously quite a few additional aspects to the vehicles that we also want to look at besides what Dave Yoakum found. Uh, one of the things that was interesting was a green fire light, I believe, was, was found, I think, in Chris's Watts, uh, Chris Watts' truck. And who knows, it's possible that Watts forgot to take the uh, pillowcases with him and perhaps set fire to them somewhere. You know, that would have been a way of getting rid of that evidence um, fairly simply, um, you know, douse it in gasoline. In, in other words, destroy evidence by burning it, using the gasoline in the gas red gas can and use the lighter to ignite it. Chris Watts didn't smoke, so, so why not? One reason why not is that the GPS data would show, have showed everywhere that he stopped. And he ultimately did stop at Black Mesa and just threw it into a dumpster. And whatever he threw into that dumpster has never been recovered, unfortunately. That, I feel, is a bit of an oversight that they should have tried to, um, first of all, check the dumpsters. And second of all, find out where the dumpsters dumped their things and, and go and look for that. But the fact that Chris Watts confessed and, and um, so on, um, it, it wasn't on the scale of an investigation uh, that, for example, the Kelsey Barrett case was, where they did go and look at garbage dumps and, you know, spent a lot of time searching. 
so it wasn't to that scale. Okay, so we've reached about the hour mark. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, keep your eyes peeled for um, the number two subject missing from the Netflix documentary. If you want to um, get notifications for that, ring the bell. Otherwise, um, subscribe and uh, you can also like, share, leave a comment. And I'll see you guys next time.